Hello. So for our parent talk this year, um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things that I see brought up in parenting books that I'm reading right now all the time. And I thought it'd be interesting to do the talk this year on those topics since they apply really well to violent practice um, and the way that I'm teaching them has changed a little bit after reading these books. So I hope that this will be a nice little pick me up as you head into the school year. This is a really, really good time to establish habits. Um, summer can get a little bit laissez faire, <laughs> but when there's a shift, that's a really great time to break a bad habit, like not practicing or establish a great new habit, like cooperating practice it, during practice and doing it daily. Um, and at the end of this summer, you're getting two shifts at once, a new substitute teacher or a new permanent teacher or simply taking a break from lessons, but still a shift and the coming of the new school year. Instead of talking about establishing a good routine, practice ideas, games, all of that, I want to talk about three other topics that I think will help your daily practice routine overall. So the topics are how to get your child to cooperate, praise, and how to deal with failure. So I want to talk about praise first. I'm going to list some tools for praise and appreciation. These make them want to work, not be scared to try and ruin their description of being good at violin, talented, smart, or whatever the thing is. Be careful of the type of praise that you give. So tool number one is describe what you're seeing. Like, I hear you got all the C sharps. I saw your umbrella fourth finger the whole time. Don't just say, good, you did so good, you're so great. But describe the details, it means a lot more to them. Tool number two, describe the effect on others. So you could say, I feel so calm when I see you, or when I hear you play and see you sway to the music or your body to the beat. Or I asked you to think about your bent thumb and you did it the entire time. That makes me feel so proud. And I know your teacher's gonna love seeing that this week, something like that. Tool number three is describe the progress that they're making. Like you listened over and over and you figured out all of those notes, you kept at it and now you can play the whole line. Or you didn't used to be able to do I can read music at all. Do you see how hard that you've worked at it week after week and now you can do it no problem? That took serious work and look how far you've come. Tool number four, describe effort. You kept working on that hard measure until you got it. Or that line in I Can Read Music was so hard for you, but you didn't give up. You were frustrated and you worked through it. And now look how much you can do. You figured out that whole song by ear. You were stuck on the middle section, but you took your time and you found the right notes. So again, just to go over, the tools are describe what you see, describe the effect on others, describe progress and describe effort. Praise effort not achievement. Don't tell them that they're smart if they do something without effort. Don't tell them that they're so good at violin when something that when something comes easy to them. And I've made that mistake many times. We want them to value their hard work not being perceived as naturally gifted. If you say you worked hard, good for you, you're telling them that you value hard work. They won't give up easily. If you praise and say you're so talented, then they'll think that they are inherently talented and not try as hard. And they'll freak out if they don't naturally get the next song automatically. I remember reading something in one parenting book and they split a group into two, or they split a group of kids into two separate groups and gave them the same test. The first group, after the test was done, they said to them, oh wow, you guys did so good. You're so smart. I'm so impressed with what good mathematicians you are. And then the second group, they gave a different type of praise. They said, these were really hard problems and you took your time to figure it out. This was challenging, but you worked your way through it and due to your perseverance, you, would try, you achieved this really high score. When both groups were asked, do you want to take another test now? 
the first group almost unanimously said no because they didn't want their label as smart being tarnished and the second group almost unanimously said yes because they wanted to keep trying keep working hard and they were excited for the challenge it's okay to praise sometimes i definitely do it but just don't praise them constantly have it be rarer than that kids may get get addicted to positive feedback if we always give it also they'll always need approval from the next person and if kids are assured praise for whatever they do they won't try hard they'll they'll give up easily don't give unconditional praise they'll be afraid of failure and assume they should always get praised these kids often drop out of school or have a really hard time picking a major. They have decision paralysis. So praise the effort. Okay, so the next topic is when there's a failure. When kids fail, don't give positive feedback. Don't deny when something went wrong. Dive into what went wrong to give them the confidence to improve. Another thing I wanted to mention is uh, don't give your kids pointers or constructive criticism or any of that after a recital or a concert. Don't make the ride home miserable. I doubt you would, but just make sure that you aren't valuing their worth on if they win or if they're perfect in a recital or like a sports game, that type of thing. Remember that we value their effort. If your child is upset and caught up in something like having a hard time memorizing a song or upset about a bad lesson or a bad performance. He might say, I'm so stupid, violin is too hard, I'll never get it. So let me actually get a piece of paper because there's this tool that I heard about that I really like. So what you could do is you could get a piece of paper and draw a wheel. Like that. So this is, again, if they're upset and thinking like, "Oh, I can't do it. I'm so I can't. I can't get. I can't get out of my head about this thing." So draw a wheel and then have the center, like the rim of the wheel, be them. And so say that. Say this is you, Jimmy. And then all around them can be different points on the wheel. All these different things here. All these different things that make up who Jimmy is. So violin is hard. That's where he's stuck right now. Then you could also have oh, something else he thinks about, his vacation that's coming up, um, his love for his dog. You could do anxiety about a test coming up. That's another thing. You could do um, his play date with his friend. Say so he really loves cooking, you could talk about cooking. Um, and then maybe something that happened recently, like his graduation from third grade or whatever. So there's all these different things that he can think about and he can think about a different thing rather than being so focused. So this violin is hard, I'll never get this. This is only one aspect of him and his life and what's going on. It's not who he is, it's just how he feels right now and he can redirect it because he does feel these other things too. These are all other truths. You're frustrated and you're struggling in the moment but that doesn't mean that you always will. It's just a hard assignment. And eventually things like this or I can't get this song, those types of things always go away. I remember, I don't know, I even in my life now when something goes wrong and I'm upset about something, I try to put it in perspective and think, how am I gonna feel about this in five minutes, in five hours, in five days, five weeks, five months, five years? At some point, I'm not gonna be upset about this thing. So sometimes reminding them that is a nice thing too. We need to help our kids identify their emotions and why they feel them. Self-awareness. Don't say, oh, you're fine. If they're upset about messing up, figure out the emotion. Shame, embarrassment, frustration, anxiety. If they can name their feeling, it helps them tame their feeling. If you try to dampen their emotions or ignore them and tell them it's not a big deal, they'll think, oh, they say it's no big deal, but I still have this big, horrible feeling. What's wrong with me? So just let them express what's going on. 
So the last topic is how to get kids to cooperate. So I have a lot of tools for this. I'm also gonna send you guys like the Google Doc for this, so it might be easier, but um, I'll kind of show you some of these. So some tools to get your child to cooperate. This is more geared towards the younger kids, but some of it's for the little kids too. So tool number one, be playful. So you could make it a game or a challenge. Like, I don't think you'll be able to do 10 circle bows in a row without bouncing any of them in 20 seconds. There's no way you can do that, that type of thing. Make inanimate objects talk. It's very popular <laughs> with my students. Many of you know Sharky and Mrs. Jellyfish at my studio. The more that I use this tool, the more I love it. Kids sometimes just do not want to listen to adults. I know they don't want to listen to me, and so I know it's a struggle at home for you. But Sharky will eat their thumb if it's not bent, or Mrs. Jellyfish, who really wants to hear etude with clean string crossings. They're totally on board. Uh, this is a huge help. It pretty much always works for me. I just forget to use it. It's hard to hear criticism or directions from a grown-up all the time, and it's so much more fun when it's a stuffed animal. You can also have the violin talk. I can't hear you. I need stronger finger taps. Or the bow. I'm so lonely. I need to feel the pinky bent on me. Something like that. You can use silly voices and accents. Like, just be silly and animated. You can take on a new persona. I do sloppy Samantha sometimes. You do like mean Margaret or happy Harry or British Brian, whatever. Uh, see what they respond to and bring it out when practice is getting tough. Just pretend that you're somebody else. And that brings me to the next one, pretend. Play the incompetent fool. I see parents do this sometimes um, in lessons, like in virtual lessons, and it really works. Like, oh man, I have no idea how to do finger taps. Is it like this? And just do it horribly wrong. I'll do this with sloppy Samantha sometimes. So you probably see me do it, but like, I'll walk out of the room and then come back in and I've taken my glasses off and I have a hat on or something like that. And I pretend that I'm my twin, my twin sister, sloppy Samantha, who just always gets something wrong. So do something wrong and then see if they can fix it. Um, or yeah, just have them do be the teacher, like have them be the teacher and teach you how to do finger taps or something like that. They love to be in the role of the teacher or the parent. And it's fun because then you can see how they perceive you or perceive me, um, the things that we say all the time. You could also try teaching a different kid. So if the child won't do something in practice, you could say, okay, I'll just do it with a stuffy and teach the stuffy how to play violin and be very loving and silly and cooing and praising and they'll likely want to join and be part of that. Okay, so then tool number two is offer a choice. Do you want to slowly make a bow hold or do you want to do it as fast as you can? Do you want to play that piece standing on one foot or both feet? Do you want to start with your current piece and then go up to reviews and then go up to bow hold stuff? Or do you want to do bow hold reviews current? Do you want to practice before dinner or after? Do you want to focus on one particular practice point that Miss Bridget assigned or Miss Janet assigned or this other one? Like, you know, we're working on bent thumb and open wrist. So which one do you want to think about today? An important point, don't make a choice. Don't turn a choice into a threat. So not like, do you want to practice or do you want to go to your room without dinner? <laughs> that type of thing. Make both options acceptable to you and your child. Okay, so tool number three, use your body. A lot of kids just need to like physically get stuff out. So if a kid is resisting something, try offering a physical thing first. Don't wanna get practice started, try skipping over to the violin or do 20 jumping jacks before we start. Put shoulder rest on and then do four frog jumps. Tighten the bow and then do four frog jumps. Something like that, getting their body. Sometimes they just need to get these wiggles out. Another idea is start this practice on the other side of the room and for every task you do, so like quick draw, take a step forward, finger taps, take another step forward, 
practice is over when you get here to me. Sometimes they just need to use their body. Tool number four is put the child in charge. So will you count how many times you did this repetition on the abacus? Will you tell me after each repetition if you think you did it correctly? Play a song and tell me going into it two things that you're gonna think about. Will you read the next thing on the practice sheet? Tool number five, give information. Keep it simple, just state the issue. Left them as straight. There are four Ds in a row. Magic X isn't touching. Not, will you bend your thumb? Can you play the four Ds? Can you move your magic X? Just keep it simple. Tool number six, say it with a word or a gesture. So again, simplicity, knees, thumb, scroll. You get the idea. This works really well for some kids. I think sometimes, and I make this mistake a lot as I use I use too many words, I use too much language, and it just kind of gets lost in translation, but just thumb, knees, that type of thing. Tool number seven, describe what I see. So appreciate progress before describing what's left to do. This is a, this is pretty, yeah, this is a good one. So like I see most of the fingers are curvy, only a few left, or I heard a, re I heard a difference between the forte and the piano section. Now can you make that difference even bigger? or I see you thinking hard about the next note. The problem is it's a third finger and not a second. How can we remember it's a second finger? Tool number eight, describe how I feel. So like for you, you could say, it makes me feel upset when I'm not being listened to, when it's practice time. When expressing anger or frustration, try to use the word I and avoid the word you. Instead of you're not listening, you're not paying attention, you're not doing X, Y, Z, try. I feel like I'm not being listened to. I feel frustrated when the things I asked to be done aren't being heard, that type of thing. Tool number nine, write a note. Put a sticky note before practice on their bow. Please bend your thumb when holding me or <coughs> on their violin scroll. Please point me to the wall or be silly and have the violin write a note to the child. I heard you play with such beautiful ringing threes yesterday. Will you do that again for me today? I bet I'll start singing when I hear you do it. And then you can sing when you hear the beautiful notes. And tool number 10 is take action without insult. If it's really not working, I'm putting the violin away for now. I can't let you put it in danger. Sometimes you just gotta stop, right? It happens. Some other ideas too is like, you could get, there's a timer that I have a couple of my students use. I have a link to it in the Google Doc, but it's like, it's a timer. And then when you, when you turn it, it's a slice of red that gets smaller and smaller. And so they can see the time go by. Like, so if you, like, if you're timing your practices, like 15 minutes, then they see it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so this just abstract idea of time, because that could be hard for them, or counting down to when it's time to practice, something like that. And then I just wanted to mention, like, don't threaten, and I do this all the time, but I need to learn not to do this, it never works out well. The problem with threatening a kid is they hear it as a dare. If you don't stop the violin swinging around, we'll stop violin lessons. It's an irresistible urge for them to swing their violin around. <laughs> um, also, I know that temptation is huge um, to threaten no more lessons or no more violin. And again, I've done this as well and regretted it because they could just say, okay, I don't wanna do this. Ooh, <laughs> and then we're in a pickle. Uh, it's better just to acknowledge their feelings that this is hard. We wish it wasn't so hard for them I remind them of things that they've struggled with in the past or that I've struggled with in the past and we've gotten through. When kids complain or say they don't want to do something or that they won't do something, think of how you would want to be responded to if you said the same thing. I wouldn't want a lecture, questions, or being compared to people not like me or being forced to do something. I would just want empathy. So be empathetic. I see you're sad. I see you want it this way. I'm sorry you feel that way. Let's take a deep breath and work through this together. 
And then I want to share a comment that one parent sent about cooperation. And she said, for cooperation, the 50 practices, long-term goals seem to work really well at keeping her motivated. Although we need to get back to that now that school's over. So this is something that I've done with a few of my students a couple months ago when I noticed, noticed that motivation was kind of dwindling for them. I gave them a blank chart with 50 boxes. So every day they practice, they fill in a box. And once they fill in the 50 boxes, they get a prize. And everyone picked a different prize, like, like a family fun day, or they get to go shopping or movie night. And that's been really helpful for some kids. So if you think that that's something that would be helpful for your child, you can definitely do that. Um, we're gonna be doing a 100 day practice challenge, the whole studio during my maternity leave. So if that works out well, we can continue on to this kind of 50 day thing um, with them after. Having a goal or a prize to work towards does wonders for cooperation. And I received another comment about the same strategy from another parent, cooperate success or cooperation success. The practice plan with tracking sheet and plan reward has worked well for us. So we can do that together or you can do that too, you know, just like have your own sheet of 50 days and then they get to pick, they get to go for ice cream with you after the 50 days, something like that. Okay, so that's my talk. And then for the questions that I received, the first question is, I love the easy, low-key pace of my child's learning. However, sometimes I wonder if setting goals or aiming to reach new levels and challenges are good or bad. So I would overall say it's good. Um, we ideally eventually want that inherent motivation and have play music to be their own joy and reward. But until then, it's always fine to use prizes or challenges, bribery, whatever we need to do before they get to that point. Just make sure that those goals and new level or new levels are reasonable and not too far reaching. Although I do have some students who thrive on learning like a really, really difficult piece and take a whole year to learn it. So everyone's different. Next question is, how long is a good practice? I know you said even five minutes daily is good or better than no practice. However, sometimes I feel like that expectations that expectation lowers the desire to put effort into the practice. So I wonder if along with that message, it's good to communicate the quality and the results that will come out of that five minute practice so the kid does not take it as all I have to do is five minutes and I'm good. So I've had a lot of you ask this question, which means I haven't addressed it enough probably with you guys. So how long should my child practice? And it's a hard question to answer. So the more they practice, the more they'll get out of it. The more they practice, the faster they'll go too. There's a chart somewhere um, and it shows how fast you'll go through the Suzuki material, depending on how much you practice. And I believe it's if you practice two hours a day, you'll get through a book, a Suzuki book in six months. If you practice 30 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes a day, it'll take about a year to get through a book. If you practice 15 to 20 minutes a day, it'll take two years per book. And if you practice 50 to 15 to 20 minutes, two or three days a week, it'll take about four years to get through the book. So that's kind of the answer there, right? Like you'll get, you'll get out what you put in. Um, five minutes, really 15, is for little kids. Um, once the habit, once the habit is established, grow that five minutes at a time. So if it's five, 15, then it grows to 10 or 20, you know, and just keep, or one minute at a time, you know, just keep kind of gradually adding to that. The five minutes thing is really just for the beginning. So they establish a daily practice routine because anyone can do five minutes. When they've been learning for a while, five minutes doesn't cut it. But it's okay if some days it is just five minutes. That just can't be the norm. By the end of book one, ideally, it's 45 minutes to an hour a practice session. But I don't like to set a certain time because then they may just not want to do it at all. Um, I remember that was my expectation in college was to practice two hours a day. And it just seems so... Yeah, I just wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and so... A lot of times I just didn't do anything because I knew I couldn't do the, two, or wouldn't do the two hours. So I wouldn't even do 20 minutes because I wasn't doing what the assignment was. I don't want to do that to them. So maybe set 30 minutes on a timer and see if they can go longer once the 30 minutes is up. 
but if they're done, then they're done. Or so for kids between Twinkle and Allegro, maybe set 15 minutes as their timer. And then once the timer goes off, say they'll do a little bit more, you know, like kind of up to them, but you know, and then after Allegro beyond there, probably more like 30, 20, 30 minutes. And like I said, by the end of book one, should probably be like 45 to 60 minutes. But every kid's different. You know, if, if you're doing consistent half hour a day practices, I'm fine with that. It's just, you'll move faster if you do 60 minutes. Um, it's most important to do all the things on the list. So if that takes 20 minutes, great. If it takes an hour, okay. Um, and the time should increase over time. And if that didn't answer the question fully, talk to me in person too, because every kid is different, right? Okay, so next question. When my child is really frustrated with herself because she's not hitting a note properly or she's having any type of frustration, how can I encourage her to keep trying without being too pushy? I would say in this situation, first acknowledge that it's hard. In all my parenting books that I keep reading, I keep reading that, acknowledging, acknowledge the feeling. Sometimes that's all you have to do. So you could say, oh man, this is a really hard note to get. You wish it was easier or I wish I could make it easier for you, that might be enough. If it's not enough, then remind them of time something else was hard, but now they think it's easy. I can read music, bow holds, twinkle, whatever. Do you remember how impossible it seemed to count and clap at the same time and I can read music? It was so hard, but we worked on it every day for a week or weeks and now look at you. If still nothing, ask them what a fair amount of times to try the repetition is. 10, five, three. And I often say, if you get three of these correctly, then you pick a game. Um, I also would encourage you in this situation to praise the effort involved. Let them know sometimes, oftentimes we don't get things right the first time, but if she keeps trying, that's so important because it means that she will get it. It may not be today, but her perseverance will get her there eventually. I had a question regarding motivation in preteen years. Are there specific motivation tactics based on age? That's a good question. I'd probably suggest exploring supplemental material. Like, are there songs from a movie that they really want to <coughs> learn that they could learn by ear? Do they enjoy improvisation or composition? Or would they enjoy working towards a goal of putting on a Zoom recital, something like that? Usually by preteen teen years, a lot of them are finding their inherent joy in creating their own music and it's harder to do the prize box challenges with them hopefully by this point they've established a good routine of practicing daily and they can feel the reward and they see what they've accomplished um i've had some teens make their own youtube channel and upload videos for them so they can watch it back and see how much they've improved but i probably mostly would stick with that like supplemental material so like after they've done their i can read music and their suzuki stuff then they could do five, 10 minutes of improv or composition or learning Harry Potter music, something like that. Okay, the next question is, do you think it may be possible in the future to have group lessons again? I know now that Miss Janet is gone and Miss Sue has retired, it would be more challenging to arrange, but I think both of my girls would really enjoy seeing other kids doing the same thing they are doing. Very good question. Group class is very important. We are planning on continuing group class for the 2022-2023 year, but due to my maternity leave and Janet's daughter is also having a baby in November, we've tentatively set a plan to have the class begin after the winter holidays, so a shorter year. Um, it'll likely be virtual still since I'm not sure how much bandwidth I'm going to have at that point to find a new space to host it. Um, but my goal is for 2023 to 2024 to resume, to resume in person somewhere that we can all be together again. How do you find the right balance between celebrating the effort versus focusing on the finished product with the goal of mastery of the skill or song? So if I understand this question correctly, yes, we can say all day, you're working so hard, you're really focusing, but if they aren't mastering the song, then what? That is a good question. If they really are struggling to master a whole song, then see if they could master a complete note, a full measure, a whole phrase. I'd set a goal of something small and achievable and have specific markers for what they're doing correctly. Like, okay, 
you get a red bead if you <clears throat> like on the abacus if you have umbrella fingers a blue bead if you have a light hand and a green bead if your eyes are on the bow eventually to achieve mastery is just about all these little accomplishments uh, and we can celebrate the effort objectively by the beads telling us. So still at the end of each session, I'd end with, wow, you worked really hard and it showed these type of phrases motivate them to keep working at it the next day. How do you optimize practice when you're busy and you know when you finally sit down to practice mentally, they are done for the day? I find in these situations, there's more frustration and battles. So you won't like this answer, but one, practice before that point happens, right after breakfast, before school. I think even if it's a shorter session, it's better to do five minutes of practice before school or right after school versus 20 minutes of practice when everyone's burnt out at 8 p.m. And on the days that it just doesn't happen and it is what it is, you have this time presented to you at the end of the day, pick and choose your battles, right? Like maybe you just pick one thing to focus on. I find I can get a lot of valuable practice in a short amount of time if we do a game like Pictionary or Tic-Tac-Toe or just make it a game night. Like we're just gonna do three games as your practice session. That's totally fine sometimes too. Um, Pictionary or Tic-Tac-Toe is a game, but you get really effective practice out of it. My question is how to ensure thoughtful practice versus just going through the motions. I had a, yeah, I had at least two of you ask a question like this. So definitely after they do an exercise, ask them, what did you do well? And what could use improvement? Make them evaluate their own playing and don't take a shrug for an answer. I get that sometimes. Or sometimes I'll have them do repetitions where they need to get a certain amount in a row correctly. So they have to do five Mississippi hot dogs in a row with straight bows. And if on the fifth one, it doesn't have a straight bow, they start over. So not just do this 10 times, but do this five times in a row correctly. Or games like Pictionary, Tic-Tac-Toe, after they do a repetition or a song or an exercise correctly. Um, I'd also use the tools I mentioned in the talk, like, will you tell me after each repetition what you think you did correctly? Or play a song and tell me two things going into it that you're gonna think about. Another question is, what are some favorite listenings beyond the Suzuki recordings? I like, I just put some down that I thought about the top of my head. So Dvorak's Eighth Symphony, I like. Dvorak's Serenade for Strings, The Check Suite, Verdi Requiem, and all the unaccompanied Bach partitas, to name a couple. But to be honest, I really love listening to bluegrass and things like that. So. Punch Brothers, Nickel Creek, Billy Strings, Love Grateful Dead, stuff like that. We find that our daughter has her own priorities when it comes to practicing. She doesn't always wanna address the hard stuff head on, so there's always a balancing act between making practice fun and making it productive. <coughs> Do you have any strategies there? It's especially challenging since she is very sensitive to feeling like a failure. It is so hard to find that balance. Um, we can play tiptoe quiet, stomp loud, or fun, silly activities all day, but are we really accomplishing anything then? Yes, but we want them to progress also as a musician. I get it. Uh, I do the card game. So the deck of cards, they pick a queen, they pick an activity, Jack, I pick an activity, or you pick an activity, King, we do a game. And then the rest of the cards, if you do a six, then you look at the practice sheet and six things down. That's the activity that you do. Or throw games in as every third activity in your practice session. Um, then when it comes down to that specific exercise or song that's difficult, but they don't wanna practice it, just keep breaking it down into manageable chunks. One note, two notes, one measure, one line. Find what they can achieve, lock into that, and then have them do it 10 times. Also, maybe wrap the instructions up in a compliment, like, wow, you got all the third fingers. Can you see if you can get just as many second fingers in tune? Something like that. Or, well, I know it's hard to play this piece with a good bow hold, but let me see you play on a little monkey with a fantastic bow hold. Wow, look how you did that. Go to Aunt Rody 
I bet if we play Go Talent Roadie as many times as you played I'm I'm a little monkey, it'll be just as easy for you to make that same bow hold the whole time. How many times do you think that is? 20, 40, 70? Let's get a blank chart of 50, whatever they say, boxes and see how fast you can fill the chart in over the next couple weeks or months or whatever. We have a few trips coming up this summer and I'm wondering what you recommend as far as practicing on vacations. When I was growing up playing piano, there wasn't a piano where we were going, then I just couldn't practice, but violins can be transported. Still, it can be difficult to pack on an airplane with all the other stuff needs for two small kids, so I prefer not to pack it every time. I also think there's value in just having straight vacation time free from regular responsibilities. Do you have guidelines you recommend for this? Like a length of time it's reasonable to be away from vacation, but if it's super long, maybe try to pack or just try to listen, sing, practice rhythms, but leave the actual violin at home. I imagine this is a question you've gotten before. It is. Um, and I got it from another parent too in this when I asked you guys all to send in questions. The only problem is when the inevitable summer camping trip or getaway comes up. When we were camping, we didn't bring the violin at all. And I only realized afterwards that we could have been doing I Can Read Music and singing songs, etc. the whole time. I'd love to hear more ideas for when you end up somewhere without the violin. So as far as when the routine breaks, camp, vacations, etc., definitely I can read music. Uh, this is my number one suggestion. It counts as a day of practicing if you just do this. Um, you can also use a pencil as a pretend bow and do bow exercises with that. Um, if you're a little more advanced, you could have your left hand on a table and practice the fingerings to a song like bum 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 like that and then you could just move your right hand like that so like air violin um you can sing songs lightly bro go tell ready scooter song active listening is really great too so throw the suzuki recording on and hum along i personally would generally recommend leaving the violin at home um, unless it's maybe for a trip that's longer than like two weeks. But I don't know. I mean, I used to bring my violin on family vacations all the time because I love performing for my distant family and my parents' friends. So if they're into that and their violins are small enough, go for it. But it's also okay to just value vacation and take a break sometimes. I wouldn't recommend bringing a violin and doing your normal practice routine while on vacation because then violin is something taking them away from the other fun that they may be having. So they could bring it, but it's more relaxed. So that's all the questions. And then I just want to share some success stories that people have shared with me. So I found that practicing in the morning after we've had breakfast is by far the most productive time. The kids are awake, I'm not exhausted, they pay attention well, and then the rest of the day is free. I've heard this from other families as well. Um, I know for some families, the idea of practicing after breakfast, like before they go to school in the school year is a hilarious joke. Um, but for a lot of families, this really, really works. They are most alert. And then once practice is done, it's done. You don't have it hanging over your head for the rest of the day. That's how I try and do my days. Like I wake up, I have a work schedule that allows, I usually don't start working until early afternoon. So I wake up and I do laundry, dishes, whatever. I work out, I meditate, I do whatever things that I want to have daily things because I'm fresh and alert and then it's done for the rest of the day. Um, so I'm most energetic when I first wake up and that's how the kids are too. So if it, it's worth trying because this works for a lot of people. Once they try it out, they're like, oh yeah, this is the magic potion. Another success story, success story is, I know it's controversial, but I found bribery works wonders. We have treat time after practice. Both girls know it and there is very little resistance ever to practice with me because of it. Treat time can be whatever your kid enjoys for mine is something sweet to eat, but I've tried other things like stickers, activities, little toys, etc. I don't need to elaborate on this very much, but yep, bribery absolutely works and it's especially for the younger kids, go for it. My daughter likes when I give her choices on things and also when I ask her what she's done well and what she could do better. She's also really into playing tic-tac-toe as a game for anything that we were practicing. Asking the kids back about what they did well and what they can prove on is such a valuable tool. Really what we want is for them to not be practicing aimlessly. That's more playing, not practicing. 
even if you feel kind of clueless as to violin skills, you can still sit in on your child's practice and ask them to evaluate their own work. Like what autonomy that gives them, right? And <laughs> the tic-tac-toe game is great too. If you need the childhood repetitions, you just make a blank board and then, okay, play that hard measure and twinkle. Okay, you did it. Good job. Where do you want to go? You want to go there. Okay, play it again. Okay, I'm going to go here. And then back and forth. And then that gets you at least eight repetitions of something that you want them to do. Alita practices better when Bianca is involved. For example, Bianca picks the rhythm for Alita to clap or they do up like a rocket together. This is for two sisters who are both learning from me. So it relates mostly to siblings, but absolutely get the whole family involved. I've learned not to push it when they are just too tired. It will only end in tears and frustration for everyone. It doesn't happen often, but when I can sense that they are too tired, I don't push it. So I really love this comment because that's something I sometimes forget in lessons. I like really want them to get this one last concept or master one technique or whatever. And sometimes I can tell they're not having it, but I push anyway. Does it ever end well? No. <laughs> <laughs> just table the activity for next time we need to remember that we want music to be enjoyable for them then they will want to come back to it the next day and try the new technique we have just started a summer routine that actually seems to be working we do about 45 minutes of summer school work then practice violin before doing a little prodigy a computer learning game so now violin is wrapped up in the reward of prodigy love this routine um, it's really good to stack habits with something that is already established. So you eat lunch every day, therefore you stack violin practice with eating lunch. Not necessarily with 10 o'clock because 10 o'clock can look different depending on the day. I especially love that he gets a reward at the end. This is very smart. Uh, what's something that your child enjoys doing? Screen time, reading their book, playing outside, whatever. You could do lunch, something that happens every day, violin, the thing they get to enjoy, a nice loop another parent said but works for us she sets up her own schedule usually first thing after eating breakfast and getting ready for school and commits to doing what is her own enrichment music math reading and then she can play or maybe gets a little reward so just like the last parent said right and so morning time then they get a little reward after Usually at 7 a.m., either she or I put the Suzuki Book One playlist on YouTube to play, and she starts getting ready to practice. She listens to it daily. She listens to it daily since it's her cue to practice, and then gets her violin and starts either reviewing the songs, and after that plays her free choice songs like Harry Potter, Vivaldi, etc. Love it. I have been trying to move away from rewards and let her realize her violin journey is hers something that she wants and asked for, something that is unique to her and a gift she is giving to herself with her dedication and work ethic. You get what you invest on yourself kind of thing. In short, she's the beneficiary of the effort she puts into her learning of any kind. I love the sentiment so much. It's a beautiful thing when a child starts to grow and learn what a gift their music is to themselves and others. I also find that for her, having the freedom to learn pieces of her interest helps her move toward forward to explore music but it also sort of distracts her from some of the current pieces so always trying to find a balance on how much input I provide on that is something I work on often so totally I wish that we had endless hours a day to practice Suzuki and supplemental songs but I will say for the kids who really love to figure out songs by ear and want to play the fun stuff go for it especially on your own time yes we want them to practice Suzuki and foundational stuff to really improve their technique but we want them to be motivated and excited to play. A healthy balance, my full permission for that. Here's something that's been working for my child and I. She sets the timer for 10 minutes and she has to be actively practicing the entire time. She can refer to the email write-up from Bridget of weekly items to practice during the practice session. We post this on the fridge so it does not get lost. Timers are great, reminders on the fridge are great. I love it. Okay, and the last success story is Success for getting my child to cooperate with practice. We have a routine now that involves food and two timers. I always make sure he eats before practicing. Then we set one timer for 19 minutes of playtime before he starts violin so he knows it's coming. And it's the timer that tells him it's time to change activities, not me. Also, if he stops what he is doing to go to do violin with a good attitude, then he gets to go right back to whatever he was doing after violin is over. 
If he refuses or whines, then we put that toy activity away and do not get to return to it until another time. Then we set a violin practice timer. Also setting expectations at the beginning of each practice time has made such a huge difference. Ours are stay on your foot chart, do your best the first time you've, you're asked without whining, complaining, or arguing, stay focused on violin, treat your violin and bow with respect and care. If he does not follow these, I give him a warning and tell him which expectation he's not following. If he continues, then we start our practice timer over again. I do give separate warnings throughout the practice for different things. There were a few weeks when we had to start the timer over sometimes, but since then he gets it and I don't have to hear whining anymore. And I'll add to that, that we started doing those expectations in our lessons together too. The mom told me those expectations and now I say them to him in every lesson. And it went from a struggle to an absolute breeze. So easy. So that's all the questions and comments I got. Thank you for watching this. Thank you for participating. And just the last thing, I just wanted to fill you in on the practice challenge that's going to happen over my maternity leave. So it's a 100-day challenge. It's going to run from September 1st to December 9th. So I'll probably stop teaching before that. <laughs> I hope this baby... Anyway, so I'll stop teaching before that probably. Um, but just wait until September 1st to start filling in. I figured then it's almost school time then. So September 1st through December 9th, you'll fill in. I, and I have, I have everything printed out. So I'll just kind of show you what it's going to look like. So everybody's going to have the sheet explaining what it is. One sheet for practicing and then one sheet for listening. So these each have a hundred boxes on them. So you fill in one box every day you practice on the front sheet, one box every day you listen on the back sheet. For every 50 days that you practice, you earn one prize. For every 50 days you listen, you earn one prize. If you practice and listen all 100 days, you earn five prizes. So that's what we're shooting for. Practicing needs to be at least five minutes, but it should be much more. <laughs> and then listening should primarily be to your Suzuki recording, but it can also be other classical music. <sighs> and that's all. So thank you again for watching and participating. Um, if there's anything that you thought of after or watching this, like, ah, oh, I should have asked that other question about praise or whatever, please, I'm here, you know, so any follow-up questions, let me know. Um, thanks again for watching. Bye.